they throw to Maybe on the unemployment line. Some people say pop. Right. Some I people say, say soda. pizza. Some people say pie. People say both. Soda pop. Ugh. All right. We Is can't. it him? It's him, right? You got to... Uh, it's him. Hope it's the Let's say hi to Bob. We have to. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Bob. Bob. Hey there, Bob. Bob. Who's there? Who's there? Hi, it's Opie, it's... Anthony, and Jim Norton. Sorry for the wait, man. Hey, you guys. How are you? We got to talk about our pubic hair for a while, Bob. I hope oh, you that's understand. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. Hey, I want to hear about where do you get these hookers for 200 bucks? Oh, I forgot. Fucking Zamuda. Um... <laughs> You can get them probably off Craig's, but I think you're better off flying uh, to, to certain locations. I think we talked about Brazil once. Oh, oh yeah, or the Moonlight Bunny Ranch, and I've never been, you've never been there. No, Dennis. Why aren't you guys coming out for the show? I thought you were going to be here. I'm in Vegas now. We were. I was going to set you up backstage, and you're going to be able to talk to everybody. What is it? The the, the net network didn't want to spend the money, or what? Ah, uh, no one tells us shit. No one tells them. Shit. I'll be out there tomorrow. I'm flying out tomorrow. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. I'm doing a show at Saget. Uh, but Opie and Anthony, we, we, we should have had them out there to broadcast. Yeah, yeah we would have loved it. But it's just, uh, I don't know. It's not going to happen again. Logistically, it didn't work out. Yeah. yeah. Cool, say. yeah. Well, we're here doing it, you know. It's going to be Saturday. Uh, and uh, Robin Whooping Billy are hosting again. And we got Roseanne Barr, Louis Black, Dale Ugly, uh, Susie Essman, Jimmy Kimmel, George Lopez, Bill Maher, Howie Mandel, Ray Romano, Rita Rudner, Dane Cook. Sarah Silverman, isn't she gorgeous? John Stewart, Steph, uh, Stephen uh, Colbert, Rosie O'Donnell. So they're all here. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. We're Sarah Silverman, uh, most fuckable female comic. Isn't she great, man? What'd you think? Is Jimmy the luckiest man? Uh, yeah, he Kimmel. is lucky to be back. Kimmel's Kimmel. nailing it, right? I thought yeah. he met me for a second. I'm like, Jimmy oh, Norton? No, wrong. Like, wow. Hey, Norton, man, how are you? I'm really good, man. Uh, I will come. I'm going to see you backstage because I got credentials. I have a guy with me, though, who doesn't have Ooh. credentials. Club Soda Kenny. He, he does, like, security for us on the road. <laughs> Can we get some credentials to come we'll, backstage? We'll take care of him. We'll take care You're of him. You're asking for credentials for during Club Soda an Kenny. interview. I am because I have to. Yeah, no, it's hard to get back there. They won't let me back. No. Oh, oh yeah. cool, guys. Hey, uh, Bob, it's Opie speaking. Uh, I got to tell you, uh, Andy Kaufman, one of my biggest influences. Oh, good. That's good to hear. Growing up, uh, just an amazing, amazing uh, performer. Yeah, he was the best, man. What what an original, huh? Absolutely. That, that was the real deal. What did you think of uh, Jim Carrey's performance? Uh, I liked it. What did you think of the movie? Uh, it was okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I guess it's hard to kind of do it all in a, in a movie is what I'm getting at because I was it, hoping they were going to go into some other things, but you only have, what, two hours Yeah, stuff? that's right. You, that would take eight hours. And, 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 and plus... Jim Carrey's performance, though, is unbelievable. Yeah, he's great. Well, you know, him and, and Coffin have the same birthday. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And Jim, you know, at the end of the film when Tony Clifton appears one year after Andy's death, in real life... Jim Carrey was actually a struggling comedian at the comedy store when that actually took place at the comedy store. Many people, you know, look, what he's like the thirty, forty million dollar man now, you know, per picture. Right. And people don't realize in comedy he spent guys and you know this, he spent eight years working for Mitzi Shore at the comedy store, two shows a night for free. Mm -hmm. So that guy put in his dues. He certainly did. Yeah, but he was a huge Andy Kaufman fan and he was determined to get the role. One of my highlights, I was performing yeah. at the at the uh, who was it, the House of Blues, and you had the 20th anniversary of his death. There was that show. Yes, yes, yeah. Were you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was on the show. Oh, Jimmy. Uh, oh, yeah, no, yeah, no, it's me. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I was Bob, on the show. Were, Bob, that was very hurtful. You were, you were funny. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, one of the highlights for me was getting my photo with Tony Clifton. I was so fucking happy to meet Tony Clifton. Oh, you got the Tony Clifton. How could picture? you not? I was supposed to be on the uh, comic relief show here, and guess what? What? It scared a few of the uh, top performers on the show, so they bumped him. Really? Uh, yep. Tony is off the show. Who wouldn't want Tony Clifton uh, on the well, show? I, well, they're scared. They thought he was going to take a drop his pants and shit or something. I don't know. <laughs> that but. blows. Hey, I, I figured out Andy's death, by the way. Yeah, go on. I got it all figured out. Okay. Like, a lot of people think that he uh, faked his own death, right? Yeah. To have the ultimate prank on, um, on everybody. Yeah. Because no one has really done that. I think... He knew he had the cancer. He knew he was going to die. And that's when he started telling people behind the scenes that, what if I went away and then came back someday? Well, I tell you, you know, there's all these theories. So many people think he's still alive. I, it took me a long time because he had, like you said, he what was so bizarre, he was planning to fake his death. And this was about six months before he 
announced that he had cancer, and then a few months after that, he died. It, it is one of the most bizarre things. And uh, well, the point I'm making though is yeah. when he knew before he started, uh, you know, uh, uh, talking about how he's going to fake his own death. And didn't tell you that maybe he went to a doctor and, oh, boy, this doesn't look good. And then he thought about it for a while and said, you know what, I, I know what I'm going to do. You know, I never heard that theory. That that could be you – know, with Andy, anything's possible. You know, he called me up and he said, you know, when he was planning on faking his death, and I said, Andy, this is one prank I can't be, be a part of. And he said, why not? I said, first of all, it's illegal. I said, people fake their death every day. Insurance scams, they don't want to play alimony. You're a member of AFTRA and SAG. You know, you fake your death. You know, there's going to be insurance. Print, you know, th th this is illegal. Yeah, because it's a, it's not a rumor anymore. I mean, there's uh, some legitimate people have come forth and said uh, he did say that he was going to fake his own oh, death. Oh yeah, you, there are executives over at you know because we were working on the Tony Clifton story at Universal at the time, and uh, Tom Mount and Sean Daniels, uh, two executives from Universal, uh, they will tell that if you walked up to them now, they would say Andy Kaufman is alive. He sat in my office. He told me he was going to do this, and you know, Andy was a health. Andy never drank. Andy never smoked. He was a vegetarian, did three hours of yoga a day. Wouldn't be in a room if anyone was smoking. Right. The fact that he came down with lung cancer was – they don't believe it. John Moffat, who uh, is a co-executive of Comic Relief with me, he had the show Fridays. He, Jim, when, when Andy had this idea, he went to see Moffat. Moffat, too. If you ask Jim Mo, John Moffat, he will say, Andy Kaufman is alive. He sat with me down in my house. He made me swear on a Bible not to tell anyone that I am – I'm going to fake my death, and I will return after 20 years. Yeah, yeah. So these are these these people have no reason to make any of this stuff up, and they believe it. You know, do I'm you believe it, there, Bob? <laughs> Listen, I you know, with Andy, I had said I can't be a part of this. Uh, I'm not going to lie to your parents, whose heart's going to be broken because you're pulling off a prank. It, I, I believe he's dead, but if he walked on stage Saturday night at Comic Relief, I would not be shocked. Oh, is that a tease? <laughs> you got a little tease going there, Bob? Well, <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, if, if, if that was going to happen, I'd work it out with Andy. It wouldn't be at Comic Relief. It would be at, like, Shea Stadium or something. It would be at exactly. the Super Bowl or something, you right? Better, we'd, and we'd build it up with you guys for, like, a year, you know. Yeah, but I've been thinking about this for a while. I've read uh, a lot of the books. Uh, yeah. uh, what was the name of yours? I read yours, Andy I believe. Andy Kaufman Revealed. Yeah, I read that one. That was excellent. Then and it was Bill Zamey's. I read his. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I pretty, great I, controversy about it. Every time there's a book out on Andy Kaufman, I, I'll, uh, I'll def I, I pick it up and read it. But uh, I thought about it. I'm like, you know what? you got to get into his mindset. I'm like, he knew he had the cancer before yeah. bef before That's anyone it. else. He knew that. He knew yeah. something was wrong and went, man, this sucks. I'm going to die. But, you know, it goes with ha what he did uh, when he was alive. And said, yep. this is, would be a cool way to leave this earth. I'll start a rumor that I'm going to fake my own death, even though I'm going to really die. And then uh, people will be talking about it 20 some odd years later. Well, you know, towards the end, uh, when he supposedly was dying, according, according to you, no, you thought he is dying. He, he does it there. I used to push him around in the wheelchair. He was down to about 75 pounds. Jesus. Chemotherapy and everything. And people in Hollywood who thought he was faking his death would come up to him and go, Andy, you with this dying bullshit. This is great. You know? And he'd laugh. Compton would laugh his ass off. It was the most, I mean, it's so bizarre. But it's so great, at least for me as his best friend, you know, it's great to entertain the thought that maybe he is still alive or he did what you said, mm -hmm. you know, that he had the wits about him. Because, you know, so many people, when it gets down to that and cancer and horrible disease, they lose it all, you know. They lose what they were all about. And Andy was such a true artist, man, he stayed the course. Right. You know, he, if anybody would do that, it, it would be him. And I remember when Elvis died, you know, and all those rumors started. That's kind of when this, because he was, a, you know, he used to do Elvis in his act and everything. And that's when it really kicked in for him. He said, man, you know, everybody's saying that Elvis faked his death. And he says, you know, he didn't. He said, but could you imagine if a performer did that and came back 20 years later? And I'd say, why, why 20 years? And he said, look, one year would be bullshit. Five, he says, if you were a real artist about it, you'd have to hang out someplace for 20 years. That's a commitment, man. No, yeah. that's Andy. Oh, fuck. Damn. I would stand on street corners and, you know, he, he pulled off more pranks on the streets than he did ever on Saturday Night Live or Letterman or anything. Yeah, tell, would you, would tell, you guys do shit in, in restaurants and stuff over a girlfriend or over a date? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I would always go, I'd go into a restaurant, you know, and, you know, we, it was all pre-planned and he'd be in there. And I, you know, I'd play kind of a timid guy, like on, on a date with a girl, you know, a girlfriend that I've been like dating for a while. And he'd come over and he'd say, you know, I'm, I'm Andy Kaufman to the girl and. 
and what's your name? I go, Bob is Muda, and he go, well, you know, I'm a big star on Taxi, and I, uh, and I just wanted to know if, uh, you know, if you'd like to go out sometime. I said, excuse me, you know, I'm on a date here with this girl. And people would hear this in the restaurant. Then he'd wait. I'd go to the bathroom, and he'd come over to the girl. Everybody in the restaurant would overhear this. And he said, look, that guy's a loser. I'm a star. I'm on taxi. I'm making 45 Gs a week. And I like you. When I want something in life, I take it. Here's what I'm going to ask. You drop this bozo right now. And I'm telling you, you will be my girlfriend for the next six months. You will meet Danny DeVito. You will meet Judd Hirsch. You will fly to me with, 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 with me to Switzerland and all this stuff, you know. And the people would be listening to this. He says, you got to tell the schmuck when he comes out of the bathroom, that's it, you're leaving with me. And I'd come out, and of course it was all set up. And the girl who was also a plant would say, you know, Bob, uh, I really like Andy. I'm going to leave with him. And people would be very upset. <laughs> you know, I'd be crying. I'd be broken. You know, and, uh, yeah, he, he was just great. And it was just, it was all day. He never stopped. It was so, you know, and he was accused of just performing. Look at the influence of just perform. And people would say, George Shapiro, the management would say, Andy, you're just performing for yourself. You're not trying to entertain people. You're not trying to be loved by the audience. And so many people, I remember Sam Kennison hired me uh, towards the end of his life as his producer and said, Bob, I'm hiring you because you know if it wasn't for Andy Kaufman, I never would have got in this business. He said, if he proved to me that you didn't have to be liked by the fucking audience, you could be hated by the audience. Andy liked it better with doing the wrestling and mm. everything and with Tony Clifton. And so it opened up a whole, whole new area, genre of, of, of in the world of comedy, like, fuck you, fuck the audience. <laughs> Who gives a fuck? Look what you guys are doing. Yeah, he was. Yeah, that's pretty much it. He was great with uh, fucking with the audience, man. Oh yeah, he, I he was... I love that about him. Uh, the uh, the Carnegie Hall show. Yes. Did they really believe the whole? Uh, it was what was it? His grandma he, he brought on stage. Oh, yeah. Don't, yeah, they, don't let me give it. Let me, don't give the punch away. Yeah, no, I won't. I won't. Yeah. So what happened with that? You know, Andy played Carnegie Hall, and this is a dream for the performer. You know, and he said when he was a little boy. He used to say to his grandma, Ma, Grandma, someday, his grandma Pearl, he says, Grandma Pearl, someday I'm going to be famous, and when I am, I'm going to play Carnegie Hall, and I'm going to give you the best seat in the house. And so he plays Carnegie Hall, and he tells the story. He opens the show by telling the story. He said, now, so I flew out. My grandma always thought I was a nut. I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't amount to anything. I flew her out for the show, and he brings this, her on stage. She was like 87 years old or something. To a standing ovation, by the way. Standing People ovation. just going nuts, like, oh, yeah, my God. Oh, yeah, and he, she couldn't believe it, and he brought her out, and she was very old. And he said, I told you I would give you the best seat in the house when I was a little boy. And she said, well, that's true, Andy. He said, ladies, and I not only flew out my grandma from, from uh, Hollywood, Florida, but I also flew out her sofa. And we brought her, her sofa out on stage, her real sofa, sat her on stage. We had a little table there for tea. We had somebody like every, you know, the show was long. Maybe about every half hour somebody came out if the, the older woman had to go to the bathroom or something. And she sat there. Okay, cut to the end of the show. And Andy, at the end, this is the famous, you know, milk and cookies. So at the end of the show, Andy says, you've been a you know, great audience, a great show. And he says, I'd like to thank my guest. I'd like to thank uh, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. And we had the doors, <coughs> excuse me, of Carnegie Hall open up oh, the boy. back doors. Oh, all 350 <laughs> members of the, Carne of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, they, these weren't plants, these weren't local people. We flew them out. Andy wanted it. They came in. Oh, no. They're singing down the aisles. He says, I also like to thank the New York City Rockettes from both wings of Carnegie Hall, 40 members of the Rockettes. These girls are coming out, kicking the their, their, their legs, the, the choir singing. He says, it was Christmas time. I'd also like to thank Santa Claus. We had it rigged that a sled came down from the, from the rafters of Carnegie Hall. It started snowing, not just on stage, in the theater. Everybody's going crazy. And he said, now, ladies, I'd, I'd like to thank my grandma and this little old lady that you watch for two, three hours on stage just sit there, gets up, I never saw a more thrilling moment in my life, gets up slowly out of the chair, walks to the footlights with all this hubbub going on around her, reaches over, pulls the face mask off, it's Robin Williams, 
and he does this most tremendous bow. The audience leaps to his feet. Pandemonium breaks out. Andy tells everyone to settle down. He said, he said that was Act 1. For Act 2, ladies and gentlemen, we're going outside. I have buses that are going to take you for milk and cookies. And Well, everybody thought he was full of shit. Went outside. We had 35 buses. It took me a year and a half to get permits to get 35 buses in front of Carnegie Hall on a Saturday night. The whole audience went up there, moved the whole audience to the New York School of Printing where we had every small little uh, uh, kindergarten table and chair we could find, had the audience sit there, gave them milk and cookies. Then we had strippers, sword swallowers, and <laughs> people. This went on to four in the morning. And Andy says to me then, at that point, he says, Muda, he's, and, and now George Shapiro is coming up to me going, he says, this overtime on the buses is going to cost tens of thousands of dollars. Andy's going to be broke. We've got to pull the plug on this. So I tell Andy, and he says, well, what should we do? What should we do? You know, I said, well, and just off the top of my head, I said, tell the audience uh, to go home and get some sleep that uh, the show is going to continue tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Uh, at the Staten Island Ferry. So he tells that, and everybody leaves. Now, next morning, 7.30, both him and I got lucky with a couple girls from the, the Radius and the Music Hall. So I'm sitting in my room, just getting a fucking head and, and coughing, you know. And about a quarter to eight, my, the phone starts ringing in my room and the next morning. And I know it's Andy because we said this thing about Carnegie, you know, meet us at, you know, over at Staten Island Ferry to the, the audience. And, uh, and I'm not answering because I don't want to leave, and I'm all burnt out from staying up for weeks working on this fucking show. Finally, he's a knock on the door, and he's not stopping. I said, yeah, Andy, what is it? You know, he says, do you think we should maybe go down to the stand line and show? Do you think anybody showed up? I said, Andy, I'm sure they think it was a joke. I said, yeah, let me go back here. I got this hot girl here, you know. This is, and, he's a, and he says, okay, well, as soon as I close the door, I hit so I go, what if there's one press person there? So I said, come here, come on, let's go. We, we all jump, in, we all jump in, in the cab with the two Radio City Music Hall girls who are in these outfits still because we wanted them to keep their outfits on, you know. No, because you brought them back to your room. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, yeah, of course. That was part of the deal. So we, we, we take, go down to Staten Line Ferry. Guys, I'm sitting there. We get down there. Yeah. There are over 350 people from the night before. It was one of the most incredible moments. And, I mean, I'm mean, brought tears to Andy's eyes. He got, he bought each of them a a round trip ticket on the Staten Island ferry, an ice cream cone, and he wrestled any woman who wanted to wrestle with him that morning. So that's how you end the show. A woman wrestling it's, thing, yeah. It's amazing. Like you see so many comedians today because there was a, a real cringe factor, a real uncomfortability. And, and I mean, with him and with what you guys did, it was like a very real thing, man. There was no bullshit about it. It was mm -hmm. commitment. It was utter commitment to the to the bit or the character at the moment and so many guys now you see doing like these really shallow attempts like they want that reputation yeah, yeah. or they want that adoration or the respect of the other comedians for doing it but they're not really it's, it's not a really organic thing for yeah them. the beauty no, is you, great, yeah, the on. beauty is you didn't care about the repercussions no, not you know what I mean. Some of these guys want to get edgy and crazy, but they're yeah. like, "Yeah, but what's gonna, uh, you know?" But you, you got to just commit and not worry about what the repercussions are gonna be in the end. That was it, with and that's and what a lot of these newer, it, newer it, guys it, that it are trying his to career. Huh? He didn't care. Yeah, absolutely. It hurt him. He was kicked off a of Saturday Night Live. Uh, nobody would touch him towards the end of, just like the movie said. Right. And he didn't care. He said, fine, get me out of this bullshit. Yeah. I don't want to be a celebrity anymore. Speaking of newer guys, what do you think of uh, Borat, Sasha? Well, you know, I haven't seen the movie yet, you know, but I've been doing a lot of interviews, you know, for the comic relief thing, and people say, well, aren't you upset that it's an Andy Kaufman ripoff? And to me, no, not at all. I think, you know, if Andy's influence is far and wide, and I, and I think that's great. You know, I haven't seen, have you seen the movie? Yeah. I've seen his character enough. I, I think he's a different type of character. Okay, I mean, because I, I don't know much about there's it. A, there's some sim similarities there. The movie was really good, a lot of laughs in there. Well, it's the idea of the commitment, I guess. He gets in this character and stays in it and goes, does shows. He I got beat up here in New York because he stayed in character. What and, do you mean he got beat up? This someone punched him, beat him up, yeah. Yeah, someone, the, he got in a huge fight downtown, I guess. Uh, he was in character and he was he was doing something that was uh, sort of gay and the uh -huh. guy didn't appreciate it. He was in character and uh, there was a huge fight <laughs> and Sasha got uh, punched a few times. Well, I think Pretty that's good. great. You know, you got to suffer for your art. Well, Bob, uh, it's it's really uh, it's really great that you're still going, man. And Comic oh, yeah. Relief is still going. It's really amazing. Well, can I can I do one more thing before oh, we yeah. get the big sure. plug in, Bob? Sure. You mentioned it uh, casually about the 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 wrestling. Yep. Um, I gotta tell you, that's the only thing that just creeps me out about Andy Kaufman, how he would just wrestle chicks on the road. Oh, you didn't like it? 
a little creepy. A little creepy. Oh, I understand if he's g getting women on the road and stuff, but he got women so he could wrestle them in his hotel yeah. room. Oh, no, uh, yeah, because, you, know, you know, if you ever saw him wrestle on Saturday night, you know, I, I was the referee, and I was always there, and it would be amazing. On Saturday, he did this. But he got off on just wrestling girls, oh, right? Oh, he did this just to pick up chicks. Right. And he just thought this was the most self-indulgent thing to do, and that's when he did it. On, and, and he used to get a huge fucking hard on when he would wrestle them in front of people. It was like a, you know... So, so before he means hard on, like he got a hard on. Yeah. Yeah. Not oh, like. Yeah. Oh yeah. This was. Oh yeah. No, he'd come, he. Most of the times he'd shoot his wad in his pants while he was wrestling. <laughs> oh. no, yeah. No, what he, a good boy. <laughs> I was so scared on Saturday Night Live that when he, we, we, he finally convinced Lauren Michaels to get him to do this because I know the whole thing was just about his sexual come on with this shit. You know, right. he didn't. He didn't care. He thought he said he he would actually say he said I can't believe Lauren Michaels is going to let let me wrestle women on TV. He says Bob, this has no entertainment value whatsoever. This is totally self-indulgence on my part, and I, I love it. So he would get the girl. So that is why he's in those long – when you see him wrestle, he's in these long johns. And backstage at Saturday Night Live, he would put on a jock strap. I would take a whole roll of duct tape, gaffer's tape, and wrap it around him. Then he'd put on a bathing suit over that, and then he'd put on long – no, then he'd put on the long johns and then the bathing suit – because I was afraid he was going to pitch a tent on live Saturday Night Live. Oh, that's and great. people would understand that what That would have been a on. moment. He, I've <laughs> got it. One. He fucked 80% of the women that he wrestled. 80%. Jesus. And we did this in concert on tours across the country when we played colleges. And 80% of these women, he, and that's what it was all about. Amazing. That's, that's he was a, he was a wallflower. He, he would never be able to you know he didn't drink. He wouldn't go into a bar. He could never pick up a girl. But on stage, the way we designed it to have the women come on stage, and then I put my hand over their heads because the audience would pick who was going to wrestle him. And of course, the guy's going to pick the hottest looking babe up there. So they selected. So every time I'm telling you we did this, you know, sometimes we'd have mad boyfriends wanting to kick his ass and everything else. But while he would be wrestling them on, on Saturday Night Live, if you watch his mouth move, because everybody's screaming when he's wrestling, I'm down there, and this is what I would hear, because I would be the ref on the mat. He's, you know, the girls, he's trying to pin the girl, the girl's trying to pin him, and this is what I would hear him say. Nobody could hear this. He'd say to the girl, he said, can you believe it? You're on Saturday Night Live right now. Millions of people are watching us. He said, he says, I want to make love to you so fucking bad. He says, you come backstage afterwards and you talk to Zamuda here. He says, I, we got, this is it, man. He says, this is so hot. This is what I would be hearing. Wow. So he just wanted to fuck these girls and wrestling was a good ruse. Yeah, that's all it was. <laughs> yeah, it was just a way to pick up chicks. What a strange way to pick up chicks. Yeah. <laughs> it worked. Wow. Yeah. Um, Great guy, though. We're very happy you oh, called him. a wonderful him. artist, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> very, no, honestly, absolutely. Recently, I just started watching Andy Kaufman uh, clips on YouTube. Uh, I haven't watched in a while and uh, finding some cool things up oh, there. Man, that odd, he died of lung guy. cancer, and his name was Kaufman. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Just find that odd. Yeah. Well, Thank we you. wrote a script for Universal Studios called The Tony Clifton Story. And that script was handed in four years. Oh, God, this is amazing. Four years before his death and on page 112 of the Tony Clifton story. You could get this online and people who have this script. In that, he has Tony Clifton die of lung cancer at Cedar sinai Hospital. Four years later, he would die of lung cancer at Cedar sinai yeah, How come he killed him so quick? Did he like? Did he had no idea he had it, and by the time he found out, it was well. Like... This, 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 this was the kind. This, this kind. The one that the cancer that he had was very fast. It's the one that gets in the lungs and boom, you know. And it's one, like one out of every hundred thousand people get this. Get, get this. Only you could have given him a good luck, bro. Well, Peter, well, Peter Jennings, I think, had the same form of lung cancer, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's fast with those guys. Speaking yeah. of uh, Tony Clifton, I, I could talk to Bob all day. The Tony Clifton when the character was so brilliant because it was a character that Andy Kaufman started with yep. and then handed off to Bob. And then uh, people are booking Andy Kaufman, uh, thinking they're getting Andy Kaufman doing yeah. Tony Clifton. And Andy Kaufman is sitting home laughing, and just another prank he pulls on everybody. And there's Bob Zamuda uh, oh, yeah. on these huge TV shows uh, because they assume it's uh, it's Andy okay. under the makeup. Oh, I did. You know, Letterman, who likes David Letterman, who likes to think he's such a control freak and he's got everything figured to fucking out, right? Yeah. Clifton did Letterman three times, and in fact, it was me. And it is I was talking about a, a, a mattress. You can't yeah. tell. Yeah, who we it. have a mattress. Hold, hold on a minute. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> who hit a button? What? 
Oh no, it's Bill. Oh my. Oh, it was Bill. Oh, Bill is Bill is freaking out. Uh, one of the guys in the engineer booth hit a button for and, a mattress uh, commercial. For a mattress commercial in the middle of you speaking. Oh, Sorry, I Bob. thought maybe they were censoring me. Yeah, Bob, just back up like ten seconds and continue. So anyway, what was I saying? What were we talking? Uh, about? Yeah, exactly. See, what, what the happens. fuck happens? This guy fire him. <laughs> you lost the headsets, right? Doesn't, doesn't yeah. Make yeah. It's even worse. What Do the hell's going on? Doesn't there? make enough money to fire him, unfortunately. <laughs> Well, you were talking about, uh, what the fuck Oh, David it? Letterman. Yeah, Letterman, who's a control freak. David Letterman as Tony Clifton. Letterman is convinced it's Andy Kaufman, because we kept it. The only people that knew this was Andy. My, I wasn't even allowed to tell my mom or my wife at the time that I was on, on I'm going to be, honey, I'm going to be on, on David Letterman. What tonight. a great nope, bit. Sworn, sworn to secrecy. Couldn't tell anyone. Working for Andy Kaufman was like working for Harry Houdini, you know? And I sat there, and during the, one of the commercial breaks, Letterman turns to me, you know, and he says, during the commercial break, he says, Andy, if it wasn't you, I would swear it was somebody else. <laughs> and he did not know this, you know, until, until years later, you know, until years later. He found out he'd been duped? The best one is, and just like in the movie, this was the great one, the, one of the greatest moments is, so Andy, so... so Harris Casino in in, uh, in Tahoe calls George Shapiro, uh, Andy's manager, who, Tony, who Danny DeVito played in the movie, and says, you know, we want to book uh, Tony Clifton up here in Harris. And, and George goes, well, you know, it's not Andy Kaufman, just what you were talking about. And the guy's, oh, yeah, 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 I, I know it's not Andy, thinking that, oh, yeah, Andy denies he's Tony. But, but George is going, no, no, it's, it's really not Andy. And the guy goes, okay, okay, I know, I get it, but we want to book him anyway, thinking they're getting Kaufman. So I go there for a, a, a two-week run in the main room of Harris Casino, right? Now, Andy would show up during the day walking around the casino to be seen to pull off this illusion. And people would come up to him, what are you doing here, Andy? And he said, oh, I um, came to see Tony Clifton, right? And they go, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, Tony Clifton. Yeah, wink, wink. <laughs> so anyway, and I would go up every night right. and play, play uh, Tony. Now, most of the time when I was up there, Andy at night would be over at the uh, Mustang uh, Ranch, you know, getting laid. He was, he was very heavy into the hookers. You know, but occasionally he would show up while I was on stage, and he'd put on a beard, you know, and a long wig, you know, and sunglasses. And he would start heckling Clifton, saying, we know, why do you do this? We know you're Andy Kaufman. Why don't you take off that makeup? And he would cause such trouble in the place. And remember, nobody knows it's Andy Kaufman, that the security from Harris would come out and haul him away. Little they know, they were hauling away the guy they hired. <laughs> Now, That's the pretty best good. of this, and I, this is the best moment. The, so anyway, every time I'm on stage every night and I'm doing Clift, and I look out, and right around the same time in the show, I look in the back of the theater, and there's one of this, because it's, you know, you know their guys, it's next to Caesars. And there was one of these brick wall, uh, z you know, sex shows, you know, Zostix, uh Vegas dance, topless girl shows. So I'd, be, I'd, I'd sit there, this one girl was a huge Andy Kaufman fan. She'd be in a rope. She'd run over from Caesar. She had a little break in her show to watch uh, Clifton because she loved Andy, you know. And I finally asked this Tony Clifton, asked one of the security guys, when I said, what is that girl coming back there? And I said, oh, well, she's a big fan of uh, Andy Kaufman's. So I figured, well, this is too good to pass up. So what I did the last couple nights, I got in contact with Tony Clifton, got in contact with her, right? He's fucking the shit out of her the last couple <laughs> nights. And, and, and then when she keeps saying, Andy, why can't you take off this Tony Clifton makeup? I'm giving her some bullshit that, oh, the, the, the run was extended. Uh, these, we have no more uh, makeup, prosthetic uh, pieces. i got to keep these on. Because if she sees it's Muda, she doesn't want to fuck Bob Smuda. Who the fuck is he? She wants to fuck Andy Kaufman. So this goes on. Okay. Six months later, and I tell, I tell Andy about this. It was amazing. She was so fucking hot. Six months late, and of course I give her, she asked for, for, for my number, so I give her Andy's number. I have her number. I give it to Andy. Six months later, Andy calls me. You know, we're back in L.A., and he, and he calls me. He says, I, says, I said, Andy, what's wrong? He says, you know that girl, that girl, that, the, 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 uh, the, the girl from, from Vegas, I mean from, from Harris? He said, she's here at LAX, and she wants to stay over with me for a few days. What should I do? I said, Andy, you already slept with her for fucking three nights. Have her come over. You know, she goes over to his house, and he's screwing her for the next couple of days. She stays there. Every a couple hours, he calls me because I now know everything. I'm, I'm briefing him. I know everything about her family, her brother's name, and whatnot. She thinks this is the same guy she was screwing that the, you know in, in in Tahoe. 
Now, what makes this so bizarre is that Andy was Jewish, you know. Oh, boy. I'm, I'm much a good going Catholic on there. boy. One of us was circumcised and the other one was not. So I don't know what the fuck she was thinking. If I strapped on some kind of prosthetic or something, you know, on my cock. Well, who's know? cut? Are you clipped or unclipped? Uh, I'm unclipped. Okay, so she fucking saw foreskin and then she didn't see any. That that makes it easier because she might have thought that you had to take it off. If she didn't see any and then she saw some, that's a problem. Who cares about <laughs> the detail? This whole thing's crazy. Yeah, that is a crazy story. Uh, but Bob, that's the kind of shit we would do yeah. know, Zamuda, all the time. I'm going to see you in Vegas um, this Good. Friday, and I'm going to go to Jimmy. Comic Relief. I'm going to give you the big plug here. This is It's great that you're doing it again for Thank Katrina you. Victims. It's uh, Comic Relief 2006. It's going to be this Saturday, November the 18th. It's 9 o'clock to midnight, and it's live. Um, it's taped late on the West Coast, I think. It's on HBO and TBS uh, simultaneously. Yep. And uh, it was announced today. Uh, let's see. That uh, Oh, it was announced today. Okay, this is an old press release we have. Right. And it's going to be from Cedars Palace in Las Vegas. Obviously, Robin Williams, Billy Crystal. You gave the whole thing. Whoopi Goldberg and a whole shitload of very famous people, man. And uh, thanks so much for calling in. I'll definitely Great. see you out there Friday. Uh, Bob, thank you so much. Thanks, I'll, Bob. I'll talk to you guys later. Take care, buddy. Cool. Okay, bye. Uh, bye. Right. Bob Zamuda. He's a great guy, man. He's really, um, he's really open. He doesn't fucking yeah. lie. Like, yeah, I banged her. She was blowing me. That he got hookers. There's no bullshit in this guy. And uh, my fucking goal is to pull a train with him. I gotta pull a Ooh. fucking train with Zamuda. I have to. Wow, that would be something. As Clifton, if he was Clifton. Yeah. Yeah, love please. As Clifton. Wait, wait. You want him as Clifton? I want him to get a girl, a girl on a rotisserie or something. Uh, while while she's blowing me, while he's fucking, I let Tony take the power position, and uh, I just want to get blown while the Tony Clifton fucks her. That's all I want to do. And then in the middle of it, though, the best part would be if Bill would hit a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Bill. Do you see his face? He just like panics. It's that stupid beard. And looks over, and 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 he was shaking again. Whenever that beard comes back. All judgment goes out the window. Yeah. All right. Uh, should Bill touch your uh, smooth skin? No, he shouldn't. I'm sure he'd do something wrong. He'd yeah, poke man. it too hard. Right. He'd poke my pubis. How about we do a quick break? We'll come back. We'll do line of the day, uh, the Osama thing real fast, and we'll get out of here. Cool.